OK, so today we have with us our first speaker of the semester. Alex Saborski is uh, an alum of our program, um, and he's going to chat with us today about his uh, long experience in intelligence in the Navy and um, all the other interesting things that he's done with his career. Um, Alex, this group is a group of freshman, sophomore, and junior leadership students who are um, in an extracurricular program that's specifically on leadership development. They're all diplomacy majors, but part of an umbrella organization that in includes students from across the university. So they're, um, they're some of our best and brightest students in the School of Diplomacy, and they are um, looking to get an advantage on building um, the skills that they will need to become leaders in our field. So we host the speaker series every semester for this group, um, and we host leaders in our field in different areas. So they get an opportunity to hear from people from different sectors um, and different levels of their career. Some just graduated, some um, who've had you know 40 and 50 year uh, careers in public and um, gov non-governmental service and things like that. So, um, we thought of you and would love to hear from you um, about your perspectives on leadership and anything that you would have to offer our students on um, things that they should try to build uh, before they go out into the field and experience the real world of diplomacy and international relations. So um, at this point, I will allow Alex to uh, share with us about his career. And then um, at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, after we're done speaking with Alex, if um, everybody could stay on for a couple more minutes, I know Peter and Drew would like to speak about the service project that they're planning for the group before we close up today. All right, so Alex, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to see you again, and please take it away. Hey, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, so I, I was actually taking a look and, and reading up on the program. Um, I remember uh, when the you know, director first got uh, selected, I got the, the email and kind of got interested in, in what the program was. So I uh, just really start off super jealous uh, that, that you all have this opportunity while you're there. Um, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of this piecemeal leadership experiences and opportunities together while we're there. Um, some of us don't, you know, don't take the opportunity or, or, or don't know what those are. Uh, so, you know, so having a, a an established uh, kind of program throughout your time there, uh, I think is is fantastic. We'll do nothing but but help you, uh, regardless of of what it is that that you do going forward. Um, you know, but specifically in in this field. Um, so I, I know you all got a, a very you know, kind of overview, uh, you know, a blurb, uh, kind of about my my time, um, but uh, it, th really the the main reason why it's good uh, to to provide an overview of, of yourself, you know, for me to give it to you, isn't for me to, to take time and talk about, you know, all the the awesome things I did do or the horrible things that I did or whatever. Um, it, it's so that you know, if you have somebody that's taking time and taking your time to to uh, kind of walk you through, give you guidance, you know, in this case for leadership. Um, we owe it to you to tell you what our background is, where we came from, so that you can at least have a foundation uh, uh, to know where we are pulling this from um, and, and where you might be able to write us off whenever we're saying something stupid or, or where things might be more applicable. So uh, with that said, uh, Alex Saborski graduated in 2008 uh, with a, a degree in uh, you know, diplomacy, international relations, and then got a secondary through Asian studies. Uh, Chinese was my language, so I uh, just kind of took the extra couple credits and got the uh, the second degree with that. So uh, uh, God bless Chinese. Um, went from there, uh, got out. I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Didn't know, uh, you know, what I wanted to get a master's degree in. That was an option. Um, so got out, went back to Kentucky, where I'm from. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, uh, sat around for, sat around, went back, was working at a restaurant for probably about six months, and then decided that I wanted to apply to the Navy after talking to some folks. Um, so, you know, short of it, about a year and a half after graduation, 
I, I went into to train with the Navy, uh, knew I was accepted into the intelligence field. So that's really where I pulled on my my international relations background um, and has kind of continued to serve me well along those lines. Um, in a little bit different of a manner, I think, than most people at least start off with when they go to, you know, uh, you know, start off with a diplomacy international relations program, but, uh, you know, worked for me nonetheless. Um, so I went from there. My first, uh, after going through Intel training, my first tour was out in Bahrain. Uh, so out in a 23 long mile uh, island in the Middle East. Um, I, I was the intelligence officer for a squadron or, or for a staff that oversaw intelligence surveillance uh, aircraft out in the Middle East. Uh, went from there to uh, the to Hawaii. Worked at a there's a SEAL team that's out in Hawaii. I worked with them for three years, uh, doing some good stuff. Uh, oversaw, uh, she's uh, anywhere between like eight to ten people, so not huge, but a, a decent amount. Um, all all of those. Um, I guess back, back, back up. So I'm, a, I'm an officer specifically, right? So we have officers even listed uh, for the Navy. And uh, so I oversaw, the, oversaw about eight or 10 enlisted folks. Uh, went from there to the to Pentagon in DC, uh, did some stuff on the Navy staff, did intelligence support for the Chief of Naval Operations, who's the senior ranking officer in the Navy and the Secretary of the Navy um, uh, and just supported their intelligence needs. Uh, while I was there, I oversaw, uh, among other things, oversaw about 10 of my fellow officers. Uh, so in previous tour were all those that were subordinate to me, you know, at, at the Pentagon, they're all my peers. Um, and, and so really only had positional authority rather than didn't have rank over them. Um, did that for three years. And then and now where I'm currently sitting is, is down in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, at Second Fleet, uh, so I was, my, my, my staff, at least not my staff, the staff I'm on oversees the uh, ships that operate from the east coast of the United States, uh, more or less up to Russia, very broadly, very generically. Um, and I'm on the intelligence staff for that. I oversee about 20 enlisted folks uh, and four or five officers on, you know, depending on the time of year. Um, Anyway, so again, general background, uh, intelligence officers, really what that means uh, is, again, very broadly, very loosely, I, I have to know what, what the adversary is doing, whoever that might be, whatever that might be. For 15 years, that's been violent extremists, uh, and uh, it slowly shifted from that to, to China and Russia, and then Iran, North Korea, and then terrorists, kind of in that tiered uh, order. Um, but 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 broadly, what is the enemy going to do? What was the adversary going to do? Um, and, and that changes whether I'm working with ships or seals or aircraft or whatever. But it's kind of the, the general line. So uh, so that's where I come from. Um, we receive very little uh, direct leadership training, uh, frankly, going into it. Uh, we have about a week long course in front of my intelligence school. Um, and, and I just got finished with a three week course, uh, 10 years in. So, um, a lot of on the job training when it comes to leadership, uh, a, a lot of painful learning, uh, you know, learning from things that I did wrong, uh, hopefully more so learning from things I did right, uh, or even better learning from things that other people have done and, and not having to do it myself period. So, um, again, general background, uh, with that, um, so I have a, a kind of general guideline. Uh, I have notes to keep myself on track because I have a tendency to ramble and, and go off the reservation. Uh, with that said, this is not about me telling you about, it's not fully about me telling you my thoughts on leadership. Um, it is mostly helping you prepare for, for, you know, piece together your thoughts on leadership, prepare for your leadership style, which will be different from mine's and Catherine's will be different from John's, from Lauren's, from Peter's and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so if throughout my rambling, uh, my somewhat guided uh, discussion, if there are any questions you have, any comments you have, any, any challenges you have to, to what I say or what I think, uh, please, by all means, chime in. Tie, I, have, I have the chat up, so if you're more comfortable chatting, do that. Um, so uh, yeah, feel free, you're not interrupting. I will not be insulted by it. Uh, I'd rather hear you talk than myself talk. So um, 
One of the the big things, and this is a good thing about the program that I, that has helped me, um, and I did not take as full advantage of it uh, as early on as I wish I had, uh, is finding a mentor. Like you really need to find somebody again, learning from somebody's mistakes. You know, being having somebody that you trust that you can talk to about, you know, a decision that or a situation that you're confronted with. Um, and, and that doesn't have to be somebody that's, you know, 10, 15, 20 years older than you or 10, 20 years more experienced than you. It can be a peer. Um, I mean, it, it can be, I mean, it can be somebody younger than you or subordinate you, than to you, depending on what the situation is. Um, there, there's no, there's no one size fits all for a mentor. Um, and as a matter of fact, you probably have several different mentors that pull from each of those categories kind of help uh, kind of give that holistic view but um, again something that, that I didn't latch on to as early as I as I should have um, and I regret but I'm, I'm making up time and, and trying to drink, jam as many as I can and uh, uh, as early as possible um, it, it you're probably sick of doing this especially in school and you've been told it over and over again and the importance of it um, but it's important enough to say again is read like read 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 uh and that's i mean newspapers great current events are great um you know we by the nature of what we're studying and what we're doing we have to do that um but but branch out beyond that go into fields that you don't normally do you know read about you know read about steve jobs or gates or president reagan or Mother Teresa or whoever it is, like read about these people who have done great things because obviously there's there's something that you can pull from what it is that they've done um, and, and do it actively. Don't don't just read it, put it off to the side. Um, I, I the number of highlighters that I've gone through and the pages that I've folded in a book, um, it, it, it's go through highlight stuff, go back and revisit it. Uh, you know, no stories is the same twice because you've changed, uh, but uh, but never get done reading, never get done learning, um, you know, pull from various leadership styles and, and piece together what best fits for you. Um, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate, you know, being in the military that, uh, you know, I always have a boss that I'm looking to really, we all do, but, but bosses that are in leadership positions, uh, and, and I keep a notebook, things that pop up randomly and, and I can, you know, scribble down, um, you know, you know, something that they did that I liked that I want to try to implement myself uh, or something that I'd never want to do ever and, and will be incredibly ashamed if I do it myself. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, just, just never stop learning from other people from reading. Um, the next thing is really is understanding and and I'm sure at some point uh, either you have or you will touch on this, but understanding the difference between leadership and management. Um, uh, you know, management is, is important. It's an organizational thing. You know, management is ensuring that that you have the right people doing the right jobs, um, that the organization is functioning. It, it, but it's more of an administrative function. Uh, leadership is is inspiring people to do something, inspiring people to move toward a, a specific goal uh, and a specific outcome. Um, and and I challenge you to, as you go through and, and, and you, you know, different actions you take within a group or, or an organization and, and just figure out if, if you're managing, again, still important, um, but uh, if you're doing that or, or, or if you're leading. Um, leadership is, is a, an action. It's not a position. Um, so you have people in a, in a leadership position, um, it, but that does not make them a leader. Um, and, and conversely, not being in a leadership position does not mean that, that you can't lead. Um, so again, it's an action. So I mean, you'll be leading over people. You, you can lead peers, um, but uh, but but take any and every opportunity you can to to do that and to, and to try to improve your ability to do that, regardless of, of what your position you're in. So uh, those are very general, broad leadership ideas, um, but. Uh, a little bit more specifically, um, I would say big thing is, is in, in, again, it's probably like the first bullet on any sort of leadership uh, uh, kind of outline, but, but listen, listen to people, listen to those that work for you, that work with you and are above you. Um, it, 
I'd say you're not going to be the expert. There'll be times that you are the expert, um, but but as the leader, uh, I I know I'm definitely not. I, I'm more and more amazed by uh, uh, those that come behind me and how much smarter you all are than I will be, uh, for sure. And so there'll be a lot more that you're experts in than, than I am. So with that said, I got I can't be afraid to ask questions. Like you can't be afraid to ask questions if you don't know, uh, you know, a subject matter or what it is that you're talking about. You know, surround yourself with that, you know, a core group of people, like that that inner circle um, that you can turn to and, and have them then fill you in on on something. Um, it, if if you don't ask a question now, uh, you know, it's better to ask it now and know it further down the road um, than be it too afraid to ask it now. Uh, and, and then when it really matters, you, you don't have that that background. Um, one of the first things that I do when I come into an organization is, is you know, I, I set everybody down. I look at them and I tell them that if, if I'm if I'm the person in the room with the best ideas, we're in trouble. Um, I, I know that I don't hold a monopoly on good ideas. Uh, and I just try to encourage those that, that work for me, especially. Uh, it's a little bit easier, those that work with you, but but those that work for you are sometimes, depending on the organization or your personality, can be hesitant to bring those forward. Um, and and I, I just try, especially you know, in the military, rank is a big thing. Uh, and, and so I just try to dispel that as much as possible and, and try to make sure that those good ideas come to fruition. Uh, and they're not stifled just because they, I am viewed as somebody that doesn't listen listen to those. Um, this is, well, it, it's harped on in the military, um, but those really successful organizations, you know, like the Googles, the Amazons, uh, you know, the IBMs, et cetera, uh, are, are you, you have to have a, a mission, a vision, and values, really kind of like three big things. So for mission, it's pretty simple. You know, like what what do you aim to do? What is your organization? You know, your 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 company, whatever it might be. Like, you know, what what are you trying to accomplish? Like, if if you like check this box, you're like mission complete. Like I'm done. Um, so I mean that that's a mission. That's what constantly guides you in everything you do. Um, and, and that needs to be very clearly stated, uh, or you're gonna have a lot of wasted effort and, and wasted time. Um, you need to create a vision. Uh, so separate from the mi mission, what are we doing? Uh, vision is really how are we going to get there? Uh, like what are the tools, what are the resources uh, that, that you're going to employ in order to achieve that mission? Uh, and then the last thing for me is, is you have to establish values within your organization. Um, I guess I rephrase that. In order to be effective, in my opinion, you have to establish those values. Um, and uh, you know, for for us again, I will continually to reference the military. Uh, for us, it, it, it's it, uh, maybe a crutch, but you know, anytime you look at uh, a leader's vision and, and like their little trifold that they hand out on on like who they are as a leader, uh, there are always three characteristics, and so. Um, so for the Navy broadly, it's honor, courage, and commitment, right? And, and everybody below that just has, oh, these are my three things that that I believe in. Um, and but, but the reason why it's good is that it allows you to impart on your people the, the things that you you know that that you hold to high esteem and how that you expect them to pour themselves. Um, and you know, that, that's not just done through a trifold or a handout or something that you give somebody, um, like you have to, it has to be something that you live, that you embody yourself, uh, or, or that you strive to embody. Uh, if you don't do that, you're not going to get buy off, uh, for people, people below you. Um, you're just going to seem hokey, uh, and, and just in, in, in disingenuous, which is my experience, one of the fastest ways to lose support from from those that you really need to have that support from to to get the job done. Um, throughout all of that, and I mentioned it briefly, but but you have to have clear guidance. Um, you know, all of those have to be clearly laid out, which is why it's you know it's good to kind of have you know posted on your website or you know in pamphlets that you have posted around the the, the job or the organization wherever it might be. Um, it just needs to be. be 
clear again. You're going to have wasted time. You're going to have people that don't feel like they have ownership, uh, that they're doing work that isn't contributing toward a specific thing. Uh, if you don't have that that very clear uh, guidance and, and way forward, um, a good way to think of it uh, is, is I'm not sure how many are uh, aware of Napoleon's corporal uh, is a, a term. I'm sorry if I throw stuff out. I can't remember what's like military speak and what is not military speak. So if something that makes sense, again, uh, just flag me down and, and ask me. But so Napoleon's corporal and, and where that derived from was that when Napoleon was plan doing his black battle plans, had his battle staff in his tent with them coming up with what they're going to do the next day, week, month. Um, he would have one of the corporals come in and shine his boots in the middle of the meeting and uh, knowing that, that that corporal was going to be listening to everything they said. And then after they got done at the end of it, he would turn to the corporal and, and ask, ask that, that that person to explain what the plan is. So his thought was that if, if they went through and they came up with a plan that was too complex for this corporal, uh, which in the, the French army was really one of the, the, the main worker bees, if you will, uh, in the army, if that corporal could not explain it, it was too complex and they had to start over again, right? So the, the point being is that, that you have to have something that's clear enough that I don't want to say the lowest common denominator, but but the lowest person, the lowest worker, you know, is very clear on what the way forward is and, and where they where they fit into that. Um, another piece is is knowing your people um, and being engaged in them. Uh, like one thing, you know, we we talk about intrusive leadership in, in the military, um, and, and frankly, we can do that a little bit more. Uh, than what some people can or are comfortable with doing in, in the, the, the private sector or other aspects of the government sector. Um, but but, but you know, even if you can't get, again, as intrusive as we can, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't know your people, that, that you shouldn't know, you know who has kids, who doesn't, uh, you know, where are people from, what are their interests, uh, what drives them really is what it comes down to, like what motivates them. Um, and, and you can't have an effective team. You can't be an effective leader, uh, if you don't know what motivates people. Um, you know, I mean, for us, the Marine Corps, the Marines motivate people by, <laughs> by public humiliation, um, and, and public ridicule, uh, not the way it is all the time, but, but frankly, like that's what they do. That's their culture. That's what drives them. They, 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 they talk about things openly and publicly. We don't do that as much in the Navy, um, and, and again, private sector different different from that as well. But um, but in, in order to, to motivate people, uh, to get people to, again to lead, right, to to inspire somebody to do something, uh, you have to know where that that inspiration comes from. Um, and you only know that if you know your people. Um, and, and real people have have real problems, right? I and mean, like people show up to work, they're they're not in a bubble. Uh, we are probably more guilty of this uh, in the military than anybody else that we have a mission and, and all else be damned. You have to get the mission done. Um, but, but, you know, like my, my, you know, second class petty officer is, is a, a father, is a son, is a brother, uh, is a husband outside of work. Uh, and they come with real problems. So, so being able to, to know your people, know their background, that way you can identify what some of those problems are. Uh, will, will really help you in in, in your efficacy. Um, I, I'm not sure if if people have looked at it, read it, uh, or or watched it, which is what I did because uh, it's a seven minute YouTube video is a lot shorter than a book. But uh, Simon Sinek uh, has has a is a is a great public speaker. Does a lot of a lot of good stuff. Um, but the thing that that stuck with me was was start with why. Um, and, and it, if you're not familiar with the concept, uh, again, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, uh, look him up. Uh, you may have already done it, but, uh, start with why is, is instead of most people go in and say, this is what, what we need to do. Um, so there, there's what we need to do. How are we going to do it? Ultimately, why we are going to do it. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't get to that. Why, um, it, something that, that helps me out a lot. Uh, especially in that that peer leadership kind of position I was in, uh, and something that I saw tangible changes from was, excuse me, 
was was sitting down and saying, this is our goal again, mission, vision, um, but, but this is what what we are trying to do. And within that, this is what I need to do to get there. Um, and, and again, it allowing it provides some people a motivation and understanding of of, of why they, they're doing what they're doing. Um, sometimes you just need to frankly tell people to to shut up in color and to do the the things that that need to get done but if you start off with why enough there there's an understanding there's a trust with those that you're leading that they know they know there's a reason they may not know why it is at that time but they know that there is a reason behind what you're asking them um and then you go back back film on the back side and, and explain that um so <laughs> I think this is hard for a lot of people. It was hard for me to do for a long time, um, but but it's knowing your weaknesses um, and, and and knowing them and, and then ex trying to work on them and then and accepting them. Um, so uh, different tools for that. I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard of Myers Briggs. Uh, there's a Hogan's assessment, um, and there are other similar type tests that you can do for free on online. Um, but uh, you know. I, I've had the opportunity to take him a couple of times and it, it just, it fascinates me to be able to look at myself on paper and kind of, look, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, to be able to look at myself on paper and, and kind of break myself down and, and it's painful. Like it's, it's hard for me to, to take a look at and realize that, that I'm more introverted. I'm not extroverted. Um, you know, that, that, I'm not good at looking at stuff um, uh, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not good at looking at stuff, um, um, you know, not going to say not emotionally, but, um, you know, it, kind of pulling some emotions out of it a little bit, looking at it, um, you know, more objectively. Um, I, I'm not good at sitting down and planning on a schedule. I'm, I'm kind of good. At, it's kind of, you know, going off the cuff. Uh, which is why I keep a list of things I should talk about and not ramble on. But, um, you know, knowing your weaknesses, playing off of your strengths and then supporting yourself with that circle that, that can make up for your weaknesses, uh, something else. Um, and then lastly, for just like general pieces is, and I mentioned this briefly, um, it, it, this might be, you know, obvious thing, but, but, but set the example. Um, you know, you can't, the, the you know, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, one of the worst phrases and should never be uttered by a leader, in my opinion. Um, it, you know, preaching to people that work for you and, and again, writing stuff on paper and putting stuff on a website and having flashy logos and sayings and, and, and values don't mean anything if, if the person that is supposed to be upholding those and, and holding those those below him or her to those values. Um, if they're if they're not if they are not embodying in that, then, then they're worthless. It's it's just ink on paper. Um, and I, I've seen too many times uh, that you know, people that have that not even gotten fired for for not abiding by those, but but just been completely ineffective because the the people that work for them didn't trust them. Uh, wouldn't follow them, uh, you know, I mean, anywhere. Uh, and that's ultimately where it came down to. So, so, so be the earliest, be the hardest working, be the most put together, be the most prepared. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it mean, that what that means is that you will have to work harder than those that work for you. Um, and, and, I don't want to say I hate to tell you, but but hard is authorized, right? I mean, it, it takes is hard work being a leader. If it was not hard work being a leader, anybody would jump into it and be able to, to fill those shoes. Um, it takes effort, it takes time, and it, take, it takes the caring to to be that person uh, and to be able to set that set that example. Um, so those are the, the broad things. Um, some of the specific things that that I have. That I've learned, uh, you know, some of it is setting an example, setting the tempo. <coughs> there was there was somebody that I worked for when I was out in Hawaii at the SEAL team, um, and as you can imagine, pretty high paced, fast paced uh, type of job, and it, it was uh, another officer, but my my immediate um, 
uh, leader, immediate boss. Uh, so there, there was there was her, myself, and then our enlisted that worked for us uh, underneath, and and very frequently came in, uh, you know, very on edge, upset, frazzled, um, you know, just trying to get the next thing done. And, and it all came from the from a good place. You know, she wanted she she was just constantly going and wanting to get stuff done. But but all of the the people that I that worked for us uh, saw. Um, you know, it was her coming in, her yelling or like quickly tasking stuff out, like running back into the back office and like, and like running back out. Um, and, and from their standpoint, it was just always like they, they, they dreaded the moment she walked in in the morning because they had, they just had no idea what they were going to get. Um, and so like, some of that speaks to, you know, again, setting that example, setting the tempo, um, but understanding the optic of the, of how you do things, uh, how you carry yourself, how you react to things, uh, it is absorbed and, and reflected by those that work for you. Um, you know, if, if you are calm, cool, and collected, uh, there's a good chance that, that they will be calm, cool, and collected. And they'll be able to respond to, you know, situations, problems, crises, uh, I'd be very surprised that if any of the jobs that you all go into, you know, don't have some of those that, that pop up at some point. Um, and, and frankly, typically we, we're the type of people that, that typically thrive on some of those and thrive on those challenges. Uh, and, you know, how you handle yourself, I mean, from day one will, will set the tone for how all those that, that work for you handle that as well. So, um, just something that, that I saw and then I tried to, to kind of be the opposite of, um, I got good feedback on it from, from one of my senior, uh, enlisted folks that, that has the, um, the, the, the permission and, and guidance to be incredibly frank with me. Um, and, and one of the things that he passed along was that was that that was helpful for people uh, and, and just being the positive, upbeat one. Um, and you, you have to commiserate sometimes with them. Um, but, but frankly, uh, you, know, you, you need to keep them in the right mindset to, to be able to do their jobs. Um, I, I mentioned the asking questions. Uh, a good friend of mine, a peer, uh, was one of those folks that always ask questions like some of them come up and and he would be you know the first one to raise his hand and say he didn't know what it was um and uh, you know some people would say that like you know, he looked stupid constantly asking questions and, and i admired the heck out of him because when it came down the road like you know, again i mentioned before he knew that answer um but from a, a leadership standpoint you need to be be willing to to ask your boss the question there, there there'll be at some point we're all we're going to be middle management um and, and we have to be be able to turn to the boss and ask him to him or her to clarify what it is that what is their vision their goal what, what is the task um and, and get that because if you don't do that then that that lack of clarity trickles down into again a waste of time and, and tasks and work that that subordinates are doing that they, they didn't need to do had you necked that down and clarified it. Um, th there was a, an admiral that I worked for that was notorious for like looking at, uh, well, sorry, captain at the time, looked at the admiral and said, yep, like Roger, got it, sir. Like, we're good to go. We'll get this done. And then the admiral walked out. The captain turned around and said, I have no idea what he wants. You five people do these five things and maybe one of them hit the mark. Um, and, and again, I saw that from the outside. Uh, I saw the pain that came with it, experienced it a couple of times, and, and just thought that it was not fair for the people doing work that went nowhere because because the leader whose job it was to to kind of brunt some of that or take some of that burden didn't ask those questions. Um, and then the last uh, observed piece was uh, when I was at the Pentagon, the the OpNav, uh, the the, the in two in six, he's, he's the intelligence officer for the Navy as a three star admiral. Uh, Vice Admiral Kohler told us when he first came in, he said that that if you're yelling or swearing, then you're losing. Um, I, I, I try to uphold the second. The first one I do pretty good. Um, but uh, now I had another boss that said you, you get one good yell in your career. 
um, and, and you better use it, better use it wisely. Um, I think, so for me personally, my mom was the yeller. Mom would yell at me, you know, I got in trouble or left the milk out or didn't cut the grass or all the stupid stuff that I did wrong when I was younger or now, um, would, you know, she, she was all, that's how she approached stuff. Like, you know, she, she, she yelled, she got angry and you get to the point where it just becomes the, the peanut teacher that like, wah, 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 you just don't really pay attention to it. Um, and then my, my dad, who was the, 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 uh, the disappointed father and, and just crushed me anytime he, he said he was not proud of me. Um, and, and, and this is an example, but that's, I mean, that happens. I, I think we've all been point where you get, you're getting yelled at and you either get so angry or so upset that you just stop paying attention. You can't absorb anything or peanuts, peanuts teacher. Um, and, and so you, if you're, if you're yelling and his point with swearing is that, that the English language is incredibly robust. And, and again, I'm sure you all are, are far more intelligent than, than I, I am and definitely was. And, and there are better, more efficient ways to say something, uh, either through yelling or through swearing. Um, but uh, that's something that he said that I hadn't really thought about. And I had a tendency to not yell at people, but like raise my voice over a crowd and everything. And, I, and I've kind of come to see the, the inefficiency of, of doing that. Um, last couple of things that I have uh, kind of planned is, is – what I learned at, at Seton Hall, um, and uh, uh, so I, I was a, I don't know if they still have these, I was a peer advisor, so coming in freshman year, uh, and, you know, okay, good, got head nods. Uh, so, so I had the fortune of, of being a peer advisor when I was there, absolutely loved it, um, had, had a blast doing it, enjoyed uh, talking about how, how, frankly, how awesome I thought Seton Hall was and how much I loved it, um, but also kind of getting to, to help people uh kind of get acclimated this you know, the school um you know into college life etc cetera, etc cetera. um but it, i mean so the, the thing with that i mean it's in the name right peer advisor it's peers right? there, there's there there isn't really a lot of opportunity uh at school to have um the, the leadership in which uh you know you are that you have so you have people that are subordinate to you um, I mean, I mean, the closest it is is something you know, like a class council or something where you you have a hierarchy, you have a president, vice president, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but even that still, it, it there it's still peers. Um, but uh, you know, having that, um, you know, you have some direct opportunities like that, like again, like you know, class council or or different organizations or Greek life or or rugby for me specifically, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and then, yeah, there's those indirect opportunities. Um, so, I mean, it, again, you don't have to be in part of an organization to, to be a leader. If that's, you know, you're walking by and somebody is, is, is you know, somebody working in the cafeteria is hauling in a box of, of you know, some of the food and, and their dolly tums over and they're sitting there and, and you have options, right? You can walk by or you can stop and help them. You can pick them up you can stop and pick up trash and throw it in the garbage can, whatever it might be like small stuff like that. All of that builds towards leaders. Um, you know, what do you do when nobody is watching? Um, or, or what do you do when, when something is, is unpopular or not cool, which, which I'm sure nobody cares about in college. Nobody cares about being popular or cool, but, um, you know, like those are the opportunities that, that, you know, you have that I had, um, that I was, decent at taking advantage of um there's still plenty that i that i look back uh and, and i wish i'd done things differently or taken advantage of more taking advantage of more things um but again like the fact that you're sitting here doing this you're already 10 steps ahead of, of me uh at, at that time um and then you know, the last thing really is is what what do i wish that i had done or learned um and I mean, there's a lot that I wish I'd learned. Uh, I mean, there's not really much you can you can really do about that. I mean, it's a learning process, and again, you never stop learning. Um, I mean, I, I could be doing this for 20 more years, and, and I'll still be learning something to my last day. Um, but what I do wish I had done uh, was, was start early. So again, good first step, good job. Um, but I mean, that's in that's 
it's not just being here. You can't just be here. Yes, that's great. You hear people talk uh, and blabber on like some of us. Um, but but again, it's doing it doing it actively. So I said, you know, active reading, but, but that goes across the board. Um, you know, I mean, if that's if, if journaling, journaling is your thing, you know, doing that, say, you know, like, what is the one thing I learned today? How I best apply it to, um, you know, myself in the future or, um, you know, again, getting mentors early and often, which, again, part of this program. Awesome. Um, but but just just starting the process early. Um, you know, I, I was forced into it coming into the Navy um, when I was working in the restaurant. I managed. But. Uh, again, I was a manager, whether, whether it was leading, probably not. Um, and I probably managed for the, for the first, you know, five to seven years of my career. Uh, I, I was I was managing when I was supposed to be leading um, and uh, uh, just, just didn't get into it as early as I as I wish I had. So um, start early, start often and, and, and do it actively. Don't don't be lulled in the fact that that you're in this great program and have this opportunity take advantage of it uh you know again do it can't say it enough do it do it actively um so those are i mean that's really all i had set aside i mean that was actually longer than i planned on speaking but uh so so open to any questions i'm sure i can continue to ramble on if nobody has anything but uh yeah, if there are any specific questions, broad questions, questions about leadership, about the Navy, about Seton Hall and South Orange or you know, whatever else it might be, uh, uh, happy to, you know, what's on the what's on Alex Zaborski's bookshelf, uh, you know, whatever. O open to you all now. This is, this is your time. Thanks so much, Alex. It was really great to hear from you. Um, this group is, um, a lot of the students in this group are big Simon Sinek fans, so I know that they were excited to hear you um, reference him. We actually did a finding our why process for the school two years ago. So, um, so those who've been around for a little while are familiar with that process, so that's exciting. I really um, resonated with what you said about you know leadership as an action not a position i think that that's really important and i haven't heard it said a lot that way in our program so i'm glad i wrote that down so that we can take that forward so thank you for that gem um okay um everybody who wants to ask a question throw those hands up and i'll i'll start calling on people to make it easy for alex um and um and we'll go from there So, are you guys sorry. having tr are you guys having trouble using your hand function? Come on. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Alex? Oh, you're muted. I think Sorry, I clicked it one too many times. Do you want me to, to call them out or are you gonna you gonna go through? I will. Are there hands? Because I don't see them I, on my I, screen. I'm, I'm seeing hands on my side. So I'm Oh. Gonna... Okay. Why don't you why don't you call then? Because none are click showing up hand. on my click screen. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to run down this list. Uh, I'm not sure in order, but uh, so go, Jasmine. Uh, see, so you have a question. What what can I do? Hello. Um, I was wondering. You said at the end that there were some mistakes and specific things that you wish that you did when you were at Seton Hall, and I'm just wondering what specifically those things are besides starting early and getting involved. Uh, yeah. No, fair. Um, yeah. General statements uh, not helpful for you guys. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, like I said, you know, I, I did the peer leadership, uh, or the peer advisor piece. Um, I, I was actually, actually, I forgot about this. Uh, I was one of the chairs of the student judiciary committee. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's still a thing. Um, so, so I did those and, and that was, that was awesome. Um, so, so activity wise, I did fine. Um, but it, really my biggest thing was, was, really just from like the, the academic the learning piece of it um I, I i didn't start diving into to reading stuff that wasn't school dictated um it, it frankly even stuff that is school dictated i mean like international agents and diplomacy like the number of books and the great people that i read about when i was in school um and uh you know not reading it for the purpose of of passing this test or writing this paper 
Um, but, but actually taking a look at it and, and, and analyzing it, trying to figure out, you know, what of what what of the pieces that I was reading, like, did I, it really resonated with me? Um, you know, like, what did I believe in? What did I think was hogwash? Um, and uh, in, in the really the academic side of it. Um, and then even within those things, those positions that I had, um, I, I never self-reflected. You know, I, I went forward and I was like, oh, like I was supposed to do this. I was supposed to accomplish X, Y, and Z, and I got it done. Um, kind of going back to that management versus leadership and which one was I doing? Um, I, the, 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 the honest, honest being the key piece, self-reflection uh, was probably the biggest, biggest piece um, in, in the leadership positions that I held that, that I didn't do as well. So uh, kind of a longer answer, but, but, you know, active academic study and then self-reflection on the, those positions that I did hold are probably the biggest pieces. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Uh, sure, go for it. <laughs> okay. um, so I promise we'll get to everybody. I'll keep my answers shorter. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, what are some other like things that you've read that have like made a difference or have like changed your perspective? And also, why did you go into the Navy? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll do I'll do the book piece first. Um, so I, I actually I went through and I scribbled down a, a few that that were good for me. Um, but for, for general leadership, um, Harvard Business Review uh, had, does, well, Harvard Business Review in general is, is great. Um, it, it's sometimes not applicable for me specifically, but um, they do they do compilations or compendiums of topics. So they have a, a leadership one, communication, persuasive arguments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and those are great because they pull out kind of like the key, you know, leadership articles that they've had throughout um, but you can literally just google harvard business review and they'll have a whole list of, of stuff um, that, that's a good one and that's an easy one that are like quick three to five pages that you can take a look at pretty quickly pull some nuggets out and revisit occasionally um, i this is i mean a little bit military focused but uh calls on chaos by by general secretary professor mattis um it, it is great to, to me, not just being a, a military professional, but uh, is a fantastic leader in general. Uh, there's a lot of good general leadership nuggets that I, that I pulled out of that book. Um, Rob Chernow, or sorry, Ron Chernow uh, is a biographer. So uh, uh, Grant biography, good uh, Hamilton biography and uh, interesting tidbit. That was it was Ron Chernow's Hamilton that inspired Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. Um, and then uh, there's a biography of Winston Churchill called Churchill Walking with Destiny, uh, which is, I, I'm a huge Churchill fan. It's really a bipolar camp. So you really, really, really like him or really don't. Uh, and I really like Churchill. Uh, and, and so that it is a, it is a doorstop of a book. You could kill somebody with it. Um, I was reading it on Kindle and I couldn't figure out why it took me, you know, four months to get through like 25 percent of the book and then i realized how long it was but um anyway so so those are kind of big ones for me um and, and those are a little bit more recent I, I can't think of like ones that clicked for me in the past specifically um but uh but, but i think those are good kind of good starting point uh for that um and, and then uh really quickly navy uh got out international relations interested in a lot of stuff not passionate about anything specific um and so which is why i didn't end up getting my master's uh after uh after Seton hall um talked to a couple of people uh, intel in general kind of fascinated me and i talked to some air force intel folks and and the coast guard intel um a couple of cousins were in the navy enlisted didn't do intel or anything like that but uh um i was a ymca kid played you know organized sports growing up so the organized structure kind of interests me but but uh, Navy Intel, uh, more so than anything else, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm biased, but it's actuality as well. But we get to do a little bit of everything. You know, I walked through what I've done, um, you know, surveillance, reconnaissance, you know, aircraft, SEAL team, big Navy ships. I'm about to go out and work my next job uh, at the end of this year. I'll go out and work with the Marines on some amphibious ships. Uh, you get to do everything. So great for me, interested in a lot of stuff, not passionate about one specific thing. Um, and 
you know, you rotate every two or three years. Uh, and so it's like professional ADD, which again, awesome. Uh, do something you like. Awesome. Great. You get to do it for a while. Um, go on to something else. And if you don't, yeah, you do it for two or three years and you move on to something you do like. So, um, all those reasons why I chose the Navy and, uh, and frankly, the, the leadership opportunity, and this is military wide, uh, but I like how we in the Navy do it. Uh, but the leadership piece is what's kept me in. Um, I, 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 I am able to talk about this for so long and I could talk about it for another hour um, easily uh, because I, I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about it because frankly, I'm afraid I'm going to screw it up. Uh, and so I do a lot of reading on it. I, 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 I take it seriously. Um, by no means am I great at it. I mean, I even be good at it, uh, but I try at it, which is a first step. Um, but but I, I, I love having that opportunity within the Navy uh, from the leadership standpoint, so. Good. All right, uh, next one up here is Mohammed. Hey, uh, sorry, I'm just heading over to the train station right now, so I'm just outside. Can you guys hear me? Yep, I, I hear you perfectly. All right. All right, awesome. I just want to start off saying thank you for coming in. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Dean Hobbin, for setting it up. And uh, my question was, uh, first, we'll start with a little assumption about what you've been through, if that's fair. Uh, I'm sure you've been in many situations where you really had to be tough and mentally strong, um, just in just various, you know, events and proceedings. But how did you consciously build up your mental strength um, and really prepare for things down the line? Yeah, it's, well, that's a good question. Um, so, yes, is the answer. There's definitely been things, uh, you know, been aspect situations uh, that, that has been a strength. Um, I, I mean, frankly, uh, at least the first part of this answer is probably not a, a, a great one. Um, but it, I, I think I'm just naturally have the proclivity uh, to, to be able to handle stressful, stressful situations fairly well. Um, but I mean, but that, that comes back to knowing your weaknesses and your strengths. Um, I, not everybody has that and that's perfectly fine. Um, and, and so uh, the, the better part of your question, I would say is that, you know, having that support structure, um, whether that is um, it's, early for most of you, but whether that's having somebody, you know, at home to, to go home to, um, but with, you know, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, friend, pet, you know, mother, father, whatever it is, um, you know, coworker, uh, having that, that structure built around you that, that you're not tackling things yourself. Um, and so whether that's to help you immediately in that situation, uh, or just to be able to, help put the pieces back together and pick you up and to, to energize you and get you ready to turn around and tackle it again the next day. Um, it, it, that's probably the, the biggest thing. Um, there are random things that have helped me working out, helps me get through stuff. Um, meditating, I, whenever I'm good about doing it, which I'm usually not, uh, I mean, helps kind of clear out the headspace and helps kind of re-energize me mentally um, so I, there, there are things like that, but, uh, it, you know, that's me. Some people it's reading, some it's going to a party, some it's, uh, you know, playing video games. It, it's just identifying that thing for you that, that just helps re-energize you, uh, you know, that helps kind of calm you down, calm your nerves and, and steal you a little bit for the, for the next event. Does that answer cool. your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. You. All right. No, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, all right, Peter. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Peter. I'm a junior diplomacy uh, student, and I'll actually be your mentee for our junior program. So I'll I'll reach out to you after this. But uh, yes, yeah, first of all, thank you. I see your face. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask about your experience on campus with uh, your you. I know you studied Chinese and uh, Asian, uh, you know, history. Uh, culture and everything in school. So did that help with your application to the Navy and with your professional experience? Or did you find that 
Um, regionally, it doesn't matter so much uh, when you get into the field, but that those skills were really important, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so uh, so the, the, the Navy is, for better, not for better, for worse, for worse, frankly, um, not always great about using uh, the skill sets that you come into the Navy with. Um, no, I, uh, yeah, so, so I, I spoke Chinese, took Chinese, to, I took it for four years there, um, and I actually had it one year when I was in high school as well, so um, outside, didn't, I'd say, get the chance, take the chance to study abroad, so outside of the opportunity, uh, pretty decent at it by the time I left. Um, you know, I had that year and change that, that I, you know, I wasn't doing anything related to any of that stuff uh, before I joined the Navy um, and, and atrophied a little bit. I, I was tried to, to keep it up, but um, excuse me, when I, when I came in, uh, like I said, first put, first place I got sent was the Middle East uh, and not much need for, for Chinese itself. Um, and, and a short answer is it's atrophied since then. I haven't touched China um, at, at at that level, um, you know, really since I came in. Um, with that said, though, th there are some benefits. I mean, I, so I've taken a couple of things. I took Chinese. Uh, I did do a study abroad. I studied Arabic, uh, did French for seven years, like up to high school. So, um, so, so that mindset uh, of not just gaining an aptitude for languages, but that mindset of what it takes to learn a language. And, and if you're doing it right, you're learning the culture with it. Um, it is really the piece that I've carried forward with me. Um, so, you know, the fact that, that I deep dived into really primarily Japanese and Chinese culture uh, and the Chinese language, um, it, you know, specifically for the Asian studies piece. And then, you know, broadly, you know, several cultures throughout the, the other studies there at the school. Um, that that skill set and that interest is really more so what carried over um and having that 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 sympathy and that empathy uh you know from the standpoint of having studied and studied in depth other cultures um is probably what i what i would say is one of my my greatest strengths carrying over into the navy so so no real direct correlation um but uh definitely some uh some indirect benefits and carryovers that have uh, that have kind of followed me into my navy career did that, did that cover down uh your question Absolutely. Thank you. All right, uh, Madeline, the next one that I have on the list here. So I feel like it's safe to say like the military is like full of natural leaders. So what do you think like different differentiates one person from another and like how you know you can move up those military ranks in terms of leadership? Um, I hope this doesn't terrify you, uh, but uh, that no, the Navy is not filled with natural leaders. Um, <laughs> we, we, we are filled with people that are forced to lead and, and like I said, a lot of on the job training. Um, so I, there's <laughs> a little more of a philosophical probably response to the first half, but like, I, I, I don't think, that, I don't think there's such thing as a natural leader. Um, I, I think that you have people that, that have a strong pro proclivity to be a leader. Um, I think there are certain qualities and characteristics that people typically associate with a good leader. Um, again, like being an extrovert, um, you know, being kind of an like analytical thinker. Um, but uh, I, I, I would challenge anyone that could, that could pull up a Myers-Briggs and say that, you know, uh, uh, an ENTP is, is definitely going to be the top leader, um, which is almost the exact opposite of what I am. But um, so I, I think that there, there are people that they're, they're forced into it. I think that they, they have, we have a, a larger group of people that, that have the willingness to at least try um, in, in order to do that. And the person that comes in to be a military officer and, 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 and enlisted that go up through the enlisted ranks um, just have, I came into the Navy knowing I was gonna be a, an, an Intel officer a naval officer first and intelligence, you know, second. And, and part of the draw for that was to lead. So um, natural leaders, maybe, maybe not. Um, but, uh, you know, going back to the, the, the second, really, or it's really the main question uh, is that I, I think it's, well, I mean, typically it's done by 
you know, learning hard lessons, it, you know, you, you fall on your face, uh, you know, hopefully you just don't do it at a time to where that it, it really, really matters. Um, and, you know, you go through, you do case studies. Um, I, I don't know, it's been in the public press. I don't know how much you looked at it, but the, the Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier that was operating in the Pacific, uh, they had a, over a thousand COVID cases and was stuck in Guam for a long time. Um, the, the commanding officer of that, that carrier got relieved. Um, whole background to that, st st you know, steps that he took that, um, you know, people argue for or against being, being a good leader, uh, things that he did. Um, but, you know, it, it's going through and taking things like that and, and breaking them down into their different parts. And, and again, that self re reflection, uh, and retrospection of, of, you know, would I do that? How would I do that? Um, you know, what would I do instead? And, and trying to use as many of those cases, big cases like that and, and, and small cases, just in, hey, how did you give this task to this person? Um, they, you know, like I said, I just got done with a three week course, um, but, but since the one that at the time was useless, I think they've improved it. Um, you know, I first came in as an ensign 10 years, got almost 11 years ago now. Um, this is the first structured leadership course that I've taken in, in 10 years. Um, and that's something that we feed back a lot. Um, and it's great when we can do it, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the frank answer is, is on the job training, learning from, uh, you know, observing other people, uh, and trying to incorporate that as much as possible. Um, I think that's, was there another part that, that you'd asked about that I missed? Oh, no, you're all good. That covered okay. it. Thank you so yeah. much. Absolutely. Like you said, maybe not the maybe not the best thing to hear that we're not we're not natural leaders, but uh, what we build them pretty pretty well. So that's, I guess that's good. Okay. Uh, uh, make sure on this one, uh, Darren. What what question can I hopefully answer for you? Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering. Do you have a common mentality or ideology that you approach things with? It, 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 anything in specific like my, my job or leading or like work-life balance like is, is there something more like specific within that that you're looking for i'd say i'd say probably just tasks and like every i wouldn't say every day but specific goals that that you approach something like i, I don't know like hard work beats talent or, or something along those lines yeah so it's so kind of kind of it would do what is what is my what is my 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 self motto or my my or say my motto like my self slogan or or something like that is that like something that like drives me just across, like throughout my life across across all aspects the umbrella kind of mindset oh man yeah i think about it a lot for like you know for leadership and, and things like that but something that i mean i i mean i, I would say for me one of the biggest things is is you know like the the person matters i guess um and I guess it's more of a leadership thing um but you know i it whether that's in interacting with people if that's in you know again how i lead or, or just how i how i you know interact with with people on the street and everything you know like the the, the person matters um it kind of leaves out a big chunk of of like work itself um i i think you know people matter and and, and hard is authorized um you know one of the uh, actually the the senior ranking intel officer in the navy right now by several bob sharp uh works at uh at nga the national geospatial intelligence agency um it, it was one thing that he said that it was kind of like a light bulb i was like oh yeah like that's like hard is authorized. Um, you know, I, I mentioned it with, with being a better leader. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's easy to, to sit down and plop down the couch and, and watch TV instead of read. And, and I say that as somebody that has binged the past five episodes or past five seasons of Chuck. Uh, but, um, you know, you need to do that sometimes, but, you know, it, being better in, in general, and it sounds super broad and useless, but, um, you know, like being better a, a, as a leader, as a person, as a student, as as a friend, um, you know, like all of these things take hard work. They take effort. Um, and, and that is 
fully and, and completely authorized. Um, and, and so just you have, you come to the fork in the road and, and decide, do I, do I take off now or do I put in the extra half hour to, to do, you know, this paper to do this little bit of research or to drive this friend to go, you know, take their cat to the vet or whatever. I know it's a horrible example, but, um, you know, like all those things, like, yeah, heart, heart is authorized. So people matter, heart is authorized. You heard it, you heard it first here. <laughs> all right. Hopefully that helps. I don't know. I don't know if anything out of that was a good sound bite. Um, Andrea, Andrea. Yeah, so I'm currently a freshman with the School of Diplomacy, and my question is, um, what did you come into Seton Hall thinking that you wanted to do kind of career rise in general and how did that change during your time at Seton Hall? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I mean, I came in, you know, diplomacy, international relations. Um, okay, first, is like, what is what? Can someone tell me what this means? I'm not quite sure. Uh, no, I, I think I State Department, I think it was the big thing that I, I was looking at. Um, but I mean, but but some of that was ignorance um, and, and not to be confused with stupidity, which existed as well, but um, just, you know, just ignorance didn't know what the options were for a diplomacy international relations to, right? It's either, you know, state department, department of state, like the, or sorry, state department or, uh, and UN, right? Like those are like the two big things that I think of, of international relations, diplomacy focused. Um, and uh, yeah, so if I had to say like what I came in thinking uh, that, that was probably it. Um, it. It very quickly, I very quickly realized that that those things are awesome, and I have friends that do those, um, but it wasn't wasn't my bag. Um, and, and so I had to quickly realize that you know international relations is pretty pervasive throughout. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you have business, and you don't have to do international business to be involved in business and in corporations. Um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, uh, KFC, well, Yum, the umbrella organization that owns KFC and others, uh, is based out of, big surprise, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and so I, I got to sit down with, with one of their uh, kind of more senior uh, executives or managers and kind of opened my eyes that, I mean, KFC is the, is the fastest, at least it was geez, uh, eight years, nine, 10 years ago when I talked to this guy, but it was the fastest growing ch chain in China. Um, and so with that, you know, you have people that have to figure out, you know, like, like culturally what is okay. Um, right. So when I, when I studied in, in Cairo, McDonald's is everywhere. They don't have a baconator or whatever. And like, they don't have a double bacon cheeseburger in a Muslim country. Um, you know, they have, they, and they have a, like a, a, a hero pita type, like sandwich, right? But, but small stuff like that very quickly realize that there are people that are in the background at headquarters or wherever that make those decisions. And they're probably people of our flavor. Um, so, uh, so quickly realized that my aperture could expand beyond, you know, state department, United Nations, or, or some similar like USAID or whatever, some similar NGO, um, but but that's definitely where I, I came in. And then some would say went the complete opposite direction when joining the military. But uh, uh, I like to I like to see that think that my job as the intelligence officer is to try to keep us out of fighting somebody. Uh, but uh, it, I mean, that's probably just me justifying it to myself. But yeah, so so one of those two, what I came in with. All right. And uh, it looks like at least as of right now, the last one is Shweta. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's right there, but, um, I kind of have two questions. Uh, the first is basically like how how intense or difficult is the process to join the Navy? And it's like the second part is kind of like what is the dynamic, I guess, between the male and female personnel, um, especially in terms of leadership uh, for female members of the Navy? Yeah, oh, uh, both very good questions. Uh, uh, so the, the first one um, is, is really bad answer, but it depends, unfortunately. Um, so it, and I say that it depends on on what specifically you're, you're going in to. Um, so super crash course. Um, so so again, intelligence officer, I'm in the intelligence field. Um, 
but the Navy, that 10 years ago, right when I came in, established what they called, it was in, what was now called information warfare, um, which is intelligence is a sliver of that. Then you have cryptology, uh, which is uh, signals intelligence, beeps and squeaks, and, and listening to people's conversations and understanding what frequencies come off radars and everything. So cryptology, uh, information professionals, which is more or less just the, I, the information technology, uh, the, the IT folks, um, and then uh, meteor- meteorology and oceanography. So, so the weather guys, very broad, but, but more or less weather guys. So all four of those um, are what has become under the umbrella information warfare. And then space has come a part of that. Cyber has become a part of that. Um, but so to say is that so I'm a small, small sliver of that. Uh, and, and there are times to where when I came in, it was fairly hard to go into intelligence. Um, and it kind of peaks and valleys depending on uh, how good we are at, at managing our people. So if a lot of people retire, we have to promote a lot of people, which means there's a gap at the bottom that we have to bring people into the Navy. Uh, and there are times where that d- doesn't happen. Um, but uh, it, frankly, going into one of those information warfare uh, uh, jobs directly out is harder. It's easier to come in as some sort of aviator, to come in as a what we call service warfare officer, which is a ship driver, more or less. Um, it's easier to come into those uh, and then maybe transfer over. So if you're looking specifically for for intelligence uh, or information warfare, it's a little more difficult, but uh, uh, to, to, not to pawn it off on them, but a recruiter can give you details specifically like at this moment or at the moment that you're, you're looking, anybody will be looking into it. Like what what are the odds? How many people are they, they, are they taking in? Um, but I mean, the process itself is, is pretty easy. You take an aptitude test, you put together a package, has the transcripts, it has, uh, you know, a, a personal message, you know, like, why, why should the Navy pick me? Um, and, and it took me, it took me about three or four months, but I kind of slow rolled it a little bit. Um, but uh, the, the process itself is, is fairly painless. Um, and then the question about, uh, you know, like, you know, females in the Navy broadly, you know, leadership specifically um, is something so it's getting it's getting a lot better, uh, and it depends. Again, it depends depends on what community you're looking at. Um, so my community, intelligence specifically, information warfare broadly, uh, is is a lot better. Um, and, and there's some reasons, or there's some, especially from a leadership or stamp standpoint. But it, there's some reasons to that that you know, at the timing, everything is now where we. You would have females that were at leadership positions in some of those other communities. We hadn't opened up the the, the aperture for women to be in those jobs. Um, you know, so about 20 years ago, women weren't allowed to be on any sort of combatant period, so they couldn't be on a destroyer, couldn't be on an aircraft carrier. Um, you know, until about five years ago, women couldn't be on submarines. Uh, and so all those are opening, and so so those those junior officers that came in are now making their way more into leadership positions. Um, we didn't have those those limitations, um, and, and so it's a pretty pretty good average as a whole. I, I can't give you exact uh, ratios, but but um, you know st- strictly from my experience, uh, you know I, I would say maybe about twenty, yeah, maybe about maybe like thirty percent women, um, you know, in the information warfare community. Um, in about an equal, it's about equal as far as leadership going up. So the percentage of the women in my community is the same percentage of women that are in leadership positions. Uh, so, so there doesn't seem to be any sort of discrimination from a from a promotion to leadership standpoint. Um, and, and, and frankly, those numbers just keep growing uh, as it, it's more as it's easier as we are putting in programs to make it easier for for you know women to be a part of the military and to to be able to still have you know work life balance um, and obviously there are things that that you know even if you know the, the female the mother's not the primary caretaker there's still obviously things like pregnancy that just happen to women that don't happen to men uh, and, and there are allowances now that that are being taken into account for the navy so I, I think that number will continue to grow. Um, and I, I hope it continues to grow because we're talking about 50% of the population that's uh, not well 
not as well represented as it should be. Um, but uh, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, and I, again, getting better, which is a good sign, not where it should be, uh, but, but improving. Thank you. Absolutely. So unless I'm missing something, I see there are no more hands up or, or hands waved. I know that, uh, that we have about 12 minutes before we, we cut off. Um, anything, uh, anything else before uh, what I would say Navy term uh, pulling chocks? <laughs> Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, thank you for managing the Q&A period too. I'm sorry that my uh, tech is failing me today. It's so strange. It literally like didn't even allow me, um, everybody, when they started speaking, their hand would pop up. Like I'd see it after they started speaking. But anyway, um, no, sorry. Can you see somebody else? Sorry, Coach. Yeah, I got Jasmine, I uh, got another hand raised. Uh, what, what, what's going on? Hi, I just wanted to ask how you decided that you didn't want to work for the State Department or the UN. This is my last question. So. Yep. I ask, like I said, I mean, one of, the, one of my points was ask questions, like ask questions, talk, whatever. Like I, 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 so open kimono, I don't believe there's no such thing as a stupid question. So far, I've not had any, uh, but it's hard to have a stupid question, but they do exist. Um, so yes, oh gosh. Um, what made me realize, yeah, so I think for me, some of it was, I, I, think, I think there are two things at least that immediately popped to mind. Um, one is just the, some of the bureaucracy, like the red tape that, that comes along with that. And I, I think that there are great people that are in those organizations that are able to breathe and and like woo saw and, and fight through the, the bureaucracy and, and get great things done um I, I don't know if if i'm one of those people that, that could have done that i say that and now i'm in the military is probably one of the worst bureaucracies in the world but um i have a little more control over that uh so i so i think that that was one um and i think the other is and this might just be me being you know short-sighted at times is there there's a lot of stuff that you do that you don't see immediate impact from um and i'm usually good at that um i got i i like i there's actually a really good quote i actually wrote it down today uh so if this is this is from the commander of 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 uh navy european command so all the navy forces in europe you don't care about that piece, but if you want a legacy, be willing to plant a tree that you will never see. Um, that was a great quote, but uh, it's so like, I like that. I could wholeheartedly, uh, uh, you know, uh, abide by that. Um, but if I'm putting in a whole bunch of work, there are times where I want to see some sort of uh, uh, kind of effect on the back end. Um, and again, great people doing that job. And, and it's like pushing molasses up a sand dune, like you're doing a whole lot of work. Uh, you don't always get somewhere with it. Um, and, and I think those are the two, probably, probably the two primary things that, again, at least that I, I think of immediately that kind of push me away from those. Um, but some people dig that challenge and, and uh, more power to them. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and I'm assuming Shweta, is this another question, right? Not a, not a hangover from before? Uh, yeah. Do we have time okay. for a quick one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, you, I, I'm showing 422. So as far as I'm aware, we have eight minutes. Is that is that right, Elizabeth? OK, yes. Okay. By all means, <laughs> it's all yours. Um, just like are there any kind of advocacy related uh, positions in the Navy, like given your experience? Um, from, from what standpoint, really, are you looking for? Um, well, I. This is kind of like a more like personal question because like I know that I want to do something related to advocacy, but the Navy is also something that's really interesting. So I was wondering if there's any kind of crossover between like those two. I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I make the argument that, that you're an advocate all the time. Um, 
So most most of the, and I think from like the advocacy standpoint, like if, if you're, like are, you, are you looking at it from the like very broadly and crudely put, just like helping people standpoint? Like is that kind of like what you're looking at? So so we have there are a couple of weird positions here and there uh, within the Navy broadly. Um, a lot of that stuff is is what we call collateral duties, right? So, so my main job is an intelligence officer. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into running the Navy and running the military um, that is not a, like, I train you to do this job, you will do this job everywhere you go, uh, and we call those collateral duties, right? So, um, and those are anything from, um, uh, gosh, it's one of the, I, I know so many acronyms, what they actually stand for. Uh, but there's like a, a drug drug abuse drug abuse prevention uh, advocate uh, sexual assault prevention response. Um, there are advocates for um, they call family advocacy programs that deal that, that they're a point of contact for um, for domestic so, so non spousal domestic violence and domestic abuse. Um, there's one for spousal domestic abuse. Um, yeah, so so but again those like those are collaterals, but I mean those are like super important jobs, obviously incredibly, incredibly important jobs within the within the military. Um and, and those are those are open to pretty much anybody and everybody that's willing to do them. Um won't be your primary, but but can take up a, a huge chunk of your time. Um to get something that's less, frankly, if you just want to say war fighting. Um, I mean, we do have public affairs officers, uh, you know, which is, you know, like the, putting out the message of the, the Navy um, and uh, let me know the fact that they can't lie. Um, so anything you get from them as far as for, to, the, to the best of their knowledge, they're telling you the truth. Um, you know, we have foreign affairs officers, uh, which is actually more very international relations focus. Um, you're pretty much supposed to be the, the SME on a specific region. And, and those are geographically focused. So you have Africa, South America, Europe. Um, and, uh, and so again, more international relations, less like war fighting specific focus. Um, and I know those aren't specific advocacy, but you know, those are things within the Navy that aren't, um, you know, what we call putting, uh, put, putting, you know, warheads on foreheads, right? So, you know, the, the kinetic aspect of, of the military. And again, your local uh, uh, recruiter can tell you all about those things. But if you ever want an unbiased uh, opinion, um, I think I'm sure we can send out my email and anybody is uh, more than more than welcome to reach out to me as well. Thanks. I'm going to cut us off there so that we have a couple of minutes to do our little housekeeping things after we um, thank Alex. But um, I do want to thank you so much. This has been very informative and helpful. Um, and I think you provided some great insight that we haven't heard from others yet. So I appreciate you um, taking the time to be with us today, especially as everyone knows at the very last minute. So um, appreciate your availability and willingness to jump in and um, give us such a, a great uh, presentation. Uh, so thank you so much, Alex. It's great to great to be with you after a number of years away from the school. Sorry we couldn't have you on campus. Maybe uh, someday in the future we'll be able to do that uh, in person together. So um, thanks. And if everybody could uh, unmute and, and we'll give a little uh, a round of applause for for the fun of it. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity, Elizabeth. And uh, like I said, you know. Peter, it's great to see your face, but I mean, if if you can, if you're willing to, I mean, I'm 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 more than happy to have my email sent out to everybody, and uh, you know, happy if anybody has any questions or follow on things that pop up, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'm more than happy to uh, to pay it forward. Thank you so much. It's great Thank to see you. you. Take care. Best of luck to everybody. Thank you. All right, guys, so I have a few things to say to you before we um, before we roll out of here. So um, let me just go through a couple of quick points and then I'll get, hand it over to Peter and Drew. OK, so hold on while I pull up my little thing here. Um, so um, if somebody could volunteer to write up a little um, 
a little reflection of this event that we could um, that we could share with others, I would appreciate it. So if you could just um, since I can't see anyone's hands, obviously, if you could put in the chat uh, that you're willing to write something up about this, that would be great. Um, I just wanted to um, say to the freshmen who haven't been part of our speaker series before um, that I know, you know, we get a lot of sort of um, military perspective from Dr. Price, and I don't want you to think that this is a military program. This is the first military related speaker that we've had um, in our speaker series thus far. Um, and I think it's, you know, certainly a great and relevant perspective in our field. Um, but I just didn't want you to think that, you know, sort of that's how we roll. Um, there will be lots of other very diverse um, speakers from different fields in the future. Uh, hold on. See what do I got here. Um, there are uh, many freshmen who did not have a check in meeting with me last week, so if you have not ha uh, scheduled a meeting with me, I need you to send me um, half a few half hour time slots that you're available next week so that we can check in. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to say, um, usually when we well, for as a as a leader of the School of Diplomacy, whenever you're asking a question at an event, um, I would like you to keep in mind that you um, sort of the protocol for the best way to start your question is to thank the speaker. Um, you know, here you don't really have to mention your name necessarily because it's right on the screen, but to tell a little bit about yourself. So to say, you know, I'm a freshman in the program. Um, and my question is so that the speaker gets a little bit more about you. If we are in for person, you would also say, you know, your name and give a little bit um, of information about about you and what your interests are. Um, and thank you all for um, all of your great questions today. Really enjoyed listening to you. Um, thought the questions were great. I thought his his um, talk was great. So now I'm going to um, lend the floor to Peter and Drew to talk about service, and um, we'll try to get you out of here um, without too much of a delay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dean Halpin. So I'll, I'll just jump in really quick about the civic engagement part of our service that we're going to be doing. Um, I need help from a few of you guys. We have a pamphlet that we need to add a bunch of information to, and